Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13 is our text this morning. Listen for God's word to you. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem came out to John, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Back when I was a college pastor, college and young adult pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church down in Santa Ana, Heidi and I bought our first home. And we had learned a ministry and a lifestyle of hospitality from, well, really from our friends Eric and Beth Keck mostly, but from others as well. And so we had college students and young adults and others in our home all the time. And we would hear very often from guests we had over compliments on how clean and orderly our house was. For those guests who were closer friends of ours, we would confess, yeah, the reason the house is clean and orderly is because we have guests over all the time. Because if you have guests coming, what do you do? You clean the house. You get things in order. You take that pile of unfolded clean laundry and you find a place to put it so it's out of sight. You take the clutter and the piles of papers and bills and you move them to an area so that it appears that you're all clean and in order, at least that you look like you're clean and ready for guests and your house is in order. People going out to hear John the Baptist were hearing a message to clean house. The crowds that went to the Jordan River to hear John the Baptist preach a message of confession for the forgiveness of sins were a part of a renewal movement 
And I don't say that just because we've been talking about renewal and I've been talking about renewal here at the church. Pick up any Bible commentary on Mark chapter 1 and you are likely to find a comment that what John had going out in the wilderness at the Jordan River was a renewal movement. And confession and baptism and forgiveness are all marks of renewal. Repentance is a mark of renewal. Those who went out to hear John the Baptist were participating in an awful lot of metaphorical cleaning house, getting their lives in God's order. The question comes, however, what do you do if you've cleaned house for guests and then the guests move in? Well, Heidi and I had that experience, that lifestyle of hospitality opened doors and we did have guests who moved in, friends who needed a place to stay, people who were in need because of family breakdowns or other problems. We had a number of people who were guests who also ended up being living guests, guests who moved in. And you know what they learned after they moved in? They learned that there were piles of laundry hidden from the normal guests. They learned that there was clutter that often collected on the kitchen table that wasn't there when people just came over. But when you lived in the house, you got to see. You got to see the real house. Mark chapter 1 is the story of God as a guest who is moving in. God in Christ is much more than a guest we visit on Sundays. God in Christ is a divine guest who moves into our lives. Almighty God, the Creator, indeed the Re-Creator. The Gospel of Mark begins the beginning of the good news. And that beginning, those two words, the beginning, is a purposeful echo of another place you'll remember hearing a phrase like that in the opening line of a book of the Bible. It's actually the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning. God created. And the author of Mark is making an intentional connection with the beginning of Gen Genesis in saying that this is now the new beginning. The new heavens and the new earth are being inaugurated and are going to be made real by this one, Jesus the Messiah. And we get another hint of that at the end of our passage, the last phrases of verse 13. Jesus is in the wilderness, but he's not alone in the wilderness, is he? He is with, he is with the wild beasts, the wild animals, and angels. It's a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth united again. If you were to take a hike out here in the Los Padres wilderness and you were to encounter a, a wild animal in the form of a mountain lion, I doubt that you would remark that you were spending time with a mountain lion because we are not with them. But Jesus will inaugurate a new heaven and a new earth where lion will lie down with lamb. I was given a lesson in the theology of the new heaven and the new earth when I was with Mike Carmel, and we were just about a mile on the other side of the top ridge of the mountains that we can see here in Sutter Canyon, clearing poison oak on a trail that leads to the Franklin Trail summit. 
And I was complaining at one point of that journey about this cursed plant, poison oak. I told this story before. And the trained theologian, the one who went to graduate school and studied Greek and Hebrew and has been nose and elbow and ears deep in scripture for these many years, I remarked to Mike, I can't wait for the new heavens and new earth when we won't have any poison oak to give us all this trouble. And our elder Mike Carmel, who has not been to graduate school and seminary or studied original language or had his head in the scriptures and commentaries as his day-to-day job, looked at me and said, you know, I think there will be poison oak in the new heaven and the new earth, only it won't give us any problems. Maybe, he said, we'll garnish our salads with it. That's a better picture. Jesus was with the wild animals. And not only that, but with angels. The new heaven and the new earth, the new creation that Jesus comes and will return to make is that uniting of heaven and earth, the separation of which we experience today. And we get these hints and signs, these direct points, here in the opening verses of the Gospel of Mark. And as I mentioned, John is there at the Jordan River and he's preaching a renewal movement. And usually if there's a genuine renewal movement, people who are attending that movement and participating in that movement, they, whether they know it or not, are going to get a lot more than they bargained for. And that will be true here with John's movement. Some of you know that I just the last few days drove up to Spokane, Washington to drop a car off for our children there at Whitworth University. And the last thing I did there before I flew home from Spokane was I drove that little used Toyota Prius to a discount tire center to get winter tires put on it so that there would not be a second accident in the snow for the Johnson family. But as the young man rung up my order for four winter tires and four rims to put those tires on, the the bill came and it was going to be almost $300 more than anticipated. So I said, no, no. that's, That's a lot more than I agreed to when we got our estimate. And he said, well, your estimate was for these simple black steel rims, these wheels, but we're out of them. So we're going to put you in these nice, good-looking alloy rims. I said, that's fine, but uh, I didn't agree to this price. And he said, okay, let me talk to the manager, and he came back a moment later. We're going we're gonna to give you these nice alloy rims, but for the, for the price we quoted you. You're going to get more than you bargained for. There's no extra cost to what the people receive when they're out there listening to John preach renewal. Many of the Jews of that day were looking and hoping for renewal. Their nation, Israel, was in what we might call maintenance mode. Many of them were looking for national revival. They were not completely subject to the Roman Empire, but they were not completely free and thriving either. They were not going to be restored to the glory days of the kingdom of David and Solomon with the Romans in power. Sure, they were still worshiping at their temple, but Roman power over them was ever-present, was oppressive, and was a constant threat. Indeed, the people of Israel experienced a mix of hope. Many of them held out a great deal of hope, but also accommodation to the the way things were and to getting along with the Romans. There was a mix of faith that God would send a Messiah and also resignation that this is the way things are 
and appear to be the way things will be. That's the case with many churches who are talking about or hoping for renewal. Is a mix of hope and resignation, a mix of faith and going along with the way things have been, the decline, the lack of life. Maybe we have a little of that going on here as well. But then John the Baptist appeared, and he drew large crowds. And his sermons on repentance, on changing your ways, aligning your lifestyle with God's lifestyle, his preaching of confession and baptism and the forgiveness of sins counterintuitively drew large crowds. It was a renewal movement, and there were true, real marks of renewal with people confessing their sins and committing themselves to lives of repentance. And the crowds were so large, as Mark says, the whole of the Judean countryside came out to see him, all the people of Jerusalem. And with these large crowds and this strong message and this active response to the preaching, there was a renewal movement and there was talk. Perhaps this strange man in clothing with camel's hair and eating a unique diet of locusts and wild honey, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe John's the one. And thankfully, John lived what he preached. John had a level of humility and a clarity on his call. And the answer was no. His message was, one will come after me who is more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to stoop down and untie. John's message was, no, I'm not the Messiah, but he is coming. God is coming The Holy Spirit is coming. I baptize you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And God arrives in Jesus. And Jesus, like all the people, was baptized by John. Like all the people, Jesus went from Nazareth in Galilee out to see John, to hear John, and be baptized by John. But unlike all the people, when Jesus came out of the water, he saw heaven torn open. He saw God's Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove. Indeed, not just descend on him, but the Greek in Mark is descend into him and then a voice from heaven this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased God arrives in Jesus and this good news of Jesus where heaven is torn open at the beginning and the spirit comes down We know at the end of the gospel, the curtain will be torn when his work is finished. Here at the beginning, the Spirit comes, and on the cross, the work of God's Son will be finished. And another tearing will happen, this time the tearing of the curtain in the temple. The good news of Jesus Christ is that in Christ and through faith in Christ, trusting in Christ as Savior, anyone can become a beloved child of God. That voice of heaven can be for any of us. You are my child, my son or my daughter, who I love. And even more, in Christ we hear from God 
that he is pleased with us, that we have come to his son and received him as our Savior and are submitting to him as our Lord and entering into the renewal movement of Jesus Christ, new life. But like every renewal movement, it is not only new life in Christ, it is eternal life in Christ. We get much more than we bargain for. Now, I preach to you who come to the parking lot most every Sunday. I can't see in all the cars, but I imagine most all of you, perhaps every one of you, have already believed. You've already confessed Jesus as your Savior your need for him and his atoning work, his forgiveness of your sins. And you've committed yourself to a lifestyle of confession and repentance. You've entered into a lifestyle of forgiveness, a lifestyle of hearing God say to you in a thousand million ways, I love you. You're my daughter or my son. With you, through Christ, I am well pleased. And if you have not, if you have not received that message, or if you have neglected it and it has a great deal of dust on it, you are invited to receive it again, to place your trust, your faith, indeed your whole life, more than you bargained for, in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and to begin a life of renewal, of confession and repentance and forgiveness and filling with God's Holy Spirit. Jesus was sent then into the desert, and we know in the rest of this gospel he'll be sent into ministry And we know that at the end, he will finally be sent to the cross. And as Christians, as little Christs, we are sent. We are sent also to the desert, to times and places of renewal. We are sent into ministry, as our mission statement says, to share the love of Christ with the world, and we are sent to proclaim the message, the message of the cross. We are sent to believe and to lead others into belief that on the cross, Christ has died for us. We are going to, after the Lord's Supper, sing a hymn. It's one we've sung before. We're not super familiar with it. The tune is easy. Or so I've been told. And it's preaching to us. Go, my children. Go, my children. Go, my children. We too, in Christ, are sent. Go with my blessing, never alone. Go with sins forgiven, at peace and pure. How much I love you. And what I can cure. God says I have made you mine forever. Here my spirit's power fills you. Go my children. Go my children. Go my children. And we will go. We have gathered and worshipped together here. And we are called to go and share Christ's love with the world. And to keep the message clear. God in Christ, Christ crucified, Christ raised. Faith and trust in him to get more than you bargained for. Renewal in this life and life eternal as well. Called to make disciples. If you wear the title Christian, you have gotten more than you bargained for. God as a guest is not just visiting and neither are you. God has moved into your life. You have moved into God's life. God does this through the Holy Spirit 
and is preparing for a time when there will be a new heavens and a new earth. I recognize, in fact, I was just telling a college student recently, this is what we would call a big ask. It's a big ask, not only to invite someone to faith, but to invite them to the whole message. The God in Christ will come again. In the beginning, God created. And in Christ, God will recreate a new heaven and a new earth. And we are a part of that movement. We are a part of God's work. And we get to taste a little bit of that kingdom banquet every time we share communion together. And so let us prepare for that.